Good morning, good evening, good night, hello, whatever time it is in your part of the world, happy World Diabetes Day and welcome, welcome, welcome to this incredibly important doc day, the World Diabetes Day doc day. My name is Renza Chevalier. I'm here from Melbourne, Australia, where I'm really sad to say that it's no longer World Diabetes Day. That was yesterday for us, but um, I'm really excited because we have a huge program today of people who are still celebrating World Diabetes Day. I'm going to say this straight off the bat, friends please do forgive me. It is 2am. It's been an extraordinarily long World Diabetes Day already, but a fabulous World Diabetes Day uh, with some really, really wonderful activities already. I've already seen so many people doing some incredible things, launching the day, announcing new initiatives, pledging to end diabetes stigma, all really wonderful and really important things. And so um, today we've got a, a program of people from around the world who are sharing what they're doing for World Diabetes Day a few really important things that they're up to uh, and, and let's talk about you know what the year ahead I guess for, with di living with diabetes is all about. I can see there are already wonderful comments coming through from people. Hi to everybody. Please do tell us where you're tuning in from so that we can see that. Now before we start uh, I have a big thank you and that is going to go to our DDoc voices because we have an incredible incredible team of voices now. Um, we've recently had two different groups attending EASD in Hamburg and uh, uh, ISPAD in Rotterdam. Um, so thank you so much to all the people who were there in person, the people who had virtual scholarships and were um, keeping up with what was going on at home and sharing that with your communities. It was really interesting when we had a look at all of the content that was being put out after uh, or during both of those consequences by, uh, conferences. By and large, it was people with diabetes from the DDoc Voices program who were sharing what they were seeing and learning. That's why it's so important that we are at these conferences. And a huge thank you as well to our partners who made it all possible. And we have Dexcom, uh, Diabolube, Lilly, Medtronic, uh, Novo Nordisk, Sanofi and Vertex. Applications are open for ATTD 2024. You don't want to miss this. If you haven't been a DDoc Voice before, please do have a look and apply. Go to ddocvoices.org uh, and and uh, uh, forward slash voices and have a look and apply. Uh, if you've already been, apply again. We, we, we absolutely have places for our uh, alumni as well. Um, but thanks so much to our voices who did such a stellar job of being there on the ground uh, and living that nothing about us without us banner. Uh, I'm thrilled to see where there are people uh, jumping in and saying they're from. We've just had somebody share that they're from Zimbabwe. Hello, hello, somebody from Peru. This really is a global chat, which completely makes sense because DDoc is a truly global organisation. Leon Tribe is joining us from Sydney and he says he's feeling my pain and I appreciate that, Leon. Okay. All right. Let's get started. We really do have a program of incredible, incredible people from around the world. I'm going to start by uh, bringing in some people to talk um, about what's going on and what they're getting up to, I guess, for World Diabetes Day at the moment. And I'm thrilled that my first speaker is going to be today, Badalino, who many from the Dear Doc Voices program know uh, because he uh, is part, uh, he, he is, of course, one of the chairs of ATTD and he's a very, very big supporter of our program. So I'm hoping that he is going to join our, there he is. Hello, good morning to you, Tade. How are you? Hi, Arinza. I'm perfect. I have to tell you, happy World Diabetes Day to all DDoc people online and those that perhaps couldn't make it yet. And to every individual with diabetes, it's a very important day. So I'm fine. I started as you did, just your day is considerably longer. <laughs> <laughs> with a morning appearance on the national TV, a very nice chat with people there. And uh, I, I hope a lot of positive vibrations are actually going out of this day, which I think is the most important part. I'm so glad when I hear that people are getting an opportunity to do that, you know, to be on, um, you know, on TV programs to talk diabetes, to talk it up, to, to talk about why it's so important. Um, how's the, how was the reception afterwards? Have you got any idea what people thought about it? Yeah, it, the replies are really vibrant. So our youngest was three years old and our oldest was actually 87, uh, you know, wow. of, of those uh, individuals with diabetes. So uh, I, I think it was quite extraordinary and one voice that we need to put more attention to diabetes. Yeah. And for this, 
let me first congratulate our 37 diabetes, 73 diabetes associations in our IDF Europe network here. And there are many more around the world in your region, in Asia, Far East and uh, all other places. Yeah. They do such an amazing job, such a thriving community that help us with organizing events, media, outreach, measuring glucose. It happened in the European Parliament. It happened in almost every important political institution inside our region. Thanks, DEDOC. It's a very important partner for IDF Europe, third year of collaboration. Of course, we collaborate much longer through ATTD. And I really believe your work, your participation, your presence is crucial. Yeah. The chair elect, I'm excited to basically invite you all to help us. We want to put more focus on diabetes, also on pre diabetes, on screening, both in type one population, where we now, with possibilities perhaps of prolonging or postponing the disease, we need a population type of screening for type one diabetes and perhaps change the course of this disease after so many decades. And for type 2 diabetes, where many, perhaps even a half, are not discovered until they have complications. And this, even in Europe, where European Union, where it should be better, still isn't. So please help us, join us in this important fight. We have now one year after the resolution of the European Parliament. And November 28, 29, we have a high-level technical summit together with the WHO Europe in Belgrade where all the ministries for health of our region will join and sign a document. Hopefully not just another piece of paper again, but a document with consequences that you all, all our diabetes associations or our DDoC members, all the online community will help spreading and making sure it really works live in practice. Yeah, and I think today, I mean, I think today is such a great day to put out these calls, you know, to be saying this is where we need to come together. We're really making a commitment, but it's not just for one day, is it? It's got to be something that's sustained and that we, um, you know, that we keep working towards this. And and I guess as, you know, Chair-elect of RDF Europe, you're thinking about this today very, very firmly, but you're thinking about this, you know, for the other days of the year and, and how we can keep that momentum going. What, what, what's your advice to us around that? Well, you know, I mean, people that know me know that, uh, you know, a, a simple reply that denies what I believe is important for people with diabetes doesn't work with me. So these politicians see me until they get sick of me. And then <laughs> they say, well, whatever you say, right? It's one way. But then the other way is that we really make understand people, you know, that they come to us, perhaps they are obese, perhaps they're close, or perhaps they even believe they have type 2 diabetes, please come in, show, yeah. don't be afraid. The sooner we start, you know, the process, the better. And now, after decades, there are medications that help reducing weight, that help putting sugar within limits at the same time. And yeah. then perhaps, you know, with this big changes in weight and, you know, glucose, also behavioral changes become more possible or more likely. People yeah. can engage more easily. So, all this we need to bring to each and every individual, completely eliminate disparities that are huge, which yeah. should not be the case. So no fear, come to us. You think you have glucose? Glucose is dangerous. Come to us and we'll try to help you. And the set for type 1 community, please help us put screening through. We will try to get everybody early in stage 2 of type 1 diabetes with antibodies, then monitor and prevent DKA that we know may be detrimental and hopefully postpone the disease at this stage. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think that, you know, these are conversations that we're having today, but we keep having them. Talking about screening in type 1 diabetes, where we're talking of screening for um, diabetes, not screening of complications. That's a, that's a whole conversation that we need to be having to get people really enthused and interested and talking in their communities about it, lobbying their local MPs and parliamentarians about it. Um, the community plays such a critical role in advancing diabetes, the way that we think and talk about diabetes beyond our own community. So today's great, but got to keep doing it tomorrow. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're so right. I mean, not only, you know, we have to persuade politicians to get funding and put it into, you know, daily routine, but we need people to accept it. And this is where perhaps the role of the DDoC community, the online community, is most important. So that people say, yeah, we want it. This is what we want. We want to screen our children. We want to screen our parents. You know what I'm saying? So it's something yeah. that is regarded as positive, as an advancement in our entire society. And this is where DDoC is a very crucial partner, actually the most important partner. We're so grateful for your support. We really are. You know, we're, we're grateful to hear you saying that, that you're showing up here today. Thank you and, and your support. Well, we're running amok at ATTD and, uh, and sitting in sessions and asking lots of questions. This partnership is very, very strong. We are so, so grateful. Thank you, Tade. Thank you very much. Thank you all. For Enjoy listening. the rest of your day. Thank you. And what, we'll keep bye it, bye. you know, we're so bye excited. Bye-bye. We're so excited to have had today here from IDF Europe, but we, we're not stopping there. We have another couple of speakers, and I'll, I'll start by bringing on uh, May Britt Skordal, if you could please join me, because good morning to you. Hello. How are you? Hello. Good day to you. Good day to you too. I'm so excited. You've got a little presentation for us, I believe, and some slides. So I will jump off and then I might ask you some questions afterwards, if that's all right. Yes, you're welcome. Fantastic. All right. Thank yeah. You. Hello to everyone. Uh, I'm a happy uh, diabetes day. This is a very special day. And yes, my name is Maybrit Skoradel and uh, I'm the chair of the board of the Faroese Diabetes Organization. This is a small organization in a very tiny country in the middle of the Atlantic, North Atlantic Ocean, um, as you can see on the picture. Um, the population of the Faroe Islands is about 54,000 and around 3,000 people are living with diabetes. 250 of them have uh, type 1 diabetes. And every year on the 14th of November, the diabetes organization marks the day with some activity. Often it allows us to get uh, on the radio, to get out uh, our message about uh, uh, to a vast uh, population. And this morning, one of the radio hosts in Good Morning Faroe Islands announced that she was dressed all in blue because of the International Diabetes Day. So we can say that people are aware of, of the day here on the Faroe Islands. Um, every year, uh, there you can see another picture. This is a church here in uh, Torshavn, uh, the capital of the Faroe Islands. Uh, every, every year the church council um, ensures that the the church tower is illuminated with the blue diabetes color and the illumination gets attention and the pictures are taken of the church and widely shared on social media. And uh, that way the diabetes cause uh, is in focus at least one day. Uh, this year, the Far East Diabetes Organization has planned a one day conference uh, on diabetes and sex. The conference is uh, organized uh, with the recently established Stino Diabetes Center on the Faroe Islands. Uh, we have had an event with, uh, with them previously, uh, which was very successful. And um, we greatly appreciate that we can work together uh, on information and to strengthen uh, conditions, conditions for uh, people with diabetes in uh, our country. And the speakers at the conference will be a senior doctor in urology and two uh, sexologists. And uh, the main uh, topic is sexual health. The speakers will emphasize the importance of communicating about sex. Also, if uh, there are challenges, uh, which can affect every, uh, anyone, but we know that people with diabetes can have challenges linked to the diabetes, uh, linked to uh, the disease. Uh, therefore, we uh, are convinced that uh, it is essential to bring up this subject, and uh, even it may it may be delicate to some. Um, 
uh, I will also say something about uh, uh, what we have done uh, last year. I'm happy to say that people with uh, diabetes on the Faroe Islands generally have very good conditions. People have access uh, to the best treatment in terms of technical equipment and medicine. Furthermore, the uh, subsidy schemes are, uh, are good. But now there is a proposal in the parliament uh, to increase co-payments for people with diabetes. And uh, we in the, the diabetes organization fear that this will reduce compliance among uh, those uh, with the fewest financial means. And we have therefore written a response to the con uh, consultation in which we express our concern uh, and that we are doing together with other patients uh, organizations that uh, are in, in the same uh, place. Um, about what we are going to do in the, uh, in the future, it's very much uh, in line with what uh, Tajay Badilina said before, uh, because we are planning to uh, uh, do, or work, we are working on a, a screening strategy, strategy to uh, find people with pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes. And uh, this is a project that we are planning together with the researchers within the hospital and the university. So uh, this is in its infancy at the moment, but uh, hopefully uh, we we'll, can tell a lot, lot more about it next year. So that's all from me. Hi there. I'm so sorry. I had a <laughs> issue there. I got rid of that. Maybe thank you so, so much. I've got to say, I know that we had a comment uh, there a moment, a moment ago from, there it is, from Elizabeth DuPont from IDF Europe. There's a small organisation in a very tiny country with <laughs> such an amazing heart and passion to support the diabetes community. And I've got to say, and doing so much, that's incredible. That upcoming conference is such an important topic. Has that been something that you've been planning for quite some time or was this something that, um, you know, sort of came to you and you went, let's Let's, let's get this done and let's get this done now. Uh, that's something that uh, we know is important and uh, we we do uh, we do do not do not enough about it. Yeah. Uh, actually, actually, it came from uh, from one of the doctors at the diabetes center uh, yes. because uh, she had uh, been to uh, another conference with uh, these people and uh, so it started that way. Wonderful. So, uh, well, thank I'm you. Very, yeah. Yeah, thank you so, so much. Is there, have you got any last moment, last things that you would like to say? I'm sure that your World Diabetes Day ahead of you is uh, shaping up to be super, even busier ahead of you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity and the happy Diabetes Day to all of you. Oh, thank you. Happy Diabetes yeah. Day to you too. And thank you so much for joining us. Looking forward thank to you. hearing all about that conference. Thank you so yes, much. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. And we're absolutely um, delighted to be continuing with uh, with our Round the IDF Europe um, uh, presentation. Can I now please welcome Mariana Yankiv, who is here from Ukraine, who's going to talk with us. We're going to have a bit of a chat about what is going on. Um, and here she's coming up. Hello there. How are you? Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello. You're from Ukraine, from Odessa. We just ended the event for 250 uh, people with diabetes. It was children and was adults. It uh, was the head of the, our city. And uh, just I'm on the street because we just ended. So we have a great diabetes day because uh, the logo of our diabetes day was like a Odessa change. Uh, thinking about diabetes, we are now going to try to go into the European Union and we try to be uh, the best as we can because we have now war and it's uh, sometimes complicated to do such a big event. So I'm sorry that I without presentation because I'm from phone from street, yeah. So, but uh, it's a great job because we have now a program for the children which um, give pumps in Odessa. Our uh, city gives money for that. And now we want to do like a, a new thing for Ukraine, uh, like a diabetes educator to help people with type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. 
to educate them because a lot of uh, patients with diabetes, we have 2 million patients with diabetes in Ukraine. So it's too much about um, 10 percent of these uh, patients live in Odessa. So now we want to do this like a school for diabetes educator. Uh, so people with medical uh, degree uh, like uh, nurses, like a pharmacist can join and uh, we want to teach them and uh, take these people to educate patients so uh, doctors will be uh, something try because uh, too much patients and too small doctors we have so now we have a like a big uh, mission because uh, it's um, now the biggest uh, diabetes day in odessa was so it's event, we have photo, we have a balloon challenge, so I can share the photo later. Uh, mm. We do. So we try to be best and try uh, as we can for the, all this event. How incredible. So it sounds like, well, it sounds firstly like you've just had an incredible event. So well done. How wonderful. Thank you. But also, it, once again, so much going on. I think one of the things that's so great uh, that we get to do uh, during our Doc Day events is we get to hear about things that are happening that perhaps other people may not get a chance to hear about or we might not know about. But I love the education idea. I know that that's such an important thing is to have health professionals yeah. really well educated about diabetes. Um, how, how are all the plans for that going now? Yeah, we try to do because I have, uh, I ended a uh, medical, I'm also a pharmacist and nutritionist and I also know how it's important when you uh, have access to this information and uh, you uh, have chance to know uh, how you uh, be with you because it's too uh, much information for patients and um, a lot of patients want to indicate but uh, they don't know where they can go so yeah we We'll do this. It will be the first uh, in Ukraine, this step. So I think uh, we will done with it. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. I'm loving all the sparkly Thank lights you. behind <laughs> you. And, yeah, uh, because it's, uh, it's a restaurant near, the, uh, it's uh, the best place uh, to have a light. Oh, well, please, please enjoy the rest of World Diabetes Day. Thank you so much for joining us Thank um, you. after your, your very big day. And um, and I hope that you get, get a chance to continue those celebrations uh, into the evening. Yeah. But thanks so much. And what a delight to hear all that's going on. And once again, we'll be checking in. We want to keep coming back and hearing about what's going on. So thank you so, so very much. Thank you. Thank you. I will just say to everybody what a great sort of little mini um, session there with people from IDF Europe and, and to um, our European friends who are watching, do connect with your local diabetes organisation that is part of IDFE, see what they're up to. I, I'm willing to bet that we just, you know, unless we, you know, we're showcasing people here, there's so much going on that you may not know about. So do, you know, reach out and, and see what they're up to. And again, it's not just for today. I know that we always make so much noise and there's a lot of buzz around World Diabetes Day, but we all know this diabetes isn't just for one day. It, it's around the years. So do go and reach out and learn what they're up to and see if there's any way that you can be involved in things like that as well. All right. I am now very, very, oh, and Elizabeth from IDF Europe says, yes, please reach out. So thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks so much for, for joining us today too. All right, I'm now going to ask Linda and Lazar to come and, and join me on screen. They're from D Youth. I want to know what this is all about. So let, let's bring them up and um, I'll get them to introduce themselves. Uh, and then we can also um, we can also find out what, what it is that they're doing and have a bit of a chat about what they've done for World Diabetes Day. And I'm completely blind to seeing what's going on in the studio, but there they are. We've got Linda. Linda, hello. How are you? Hello. I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> And there's Lazar. Lazar, happy Diabetes Day to you. How are Hello. you? Hello. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really good. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Wonderful. Tell us about D Youth. What, what is it? Tell us what it's all about and why you want us getting all excited about it. Linda, I'm going to start with you. Um, yes, I can also start. We had a uh, lack of schedule, but it doesn't matter. So um, we are here to rep represent the youth. Um, the youth is a group of six young people with, uh, living with type 1 diabetes and, and we are from six different um, countries. So it's Anna, Lazar, Madalena, Maria, Julia and I. 
And we all have been in the IDF Youth Leadership Lab in Bulgaria this summer. And there we experienced a um, shared experience session. That means that we all sat in a circle and shared our experiences um, with the um, daily, with our daily life with diabetes. And that was so impactful and so emotional. And we had this feeling of togetherness and being connected with each other and the community. And we had the desire to preserve this feeling. And so we decided to make a podcast and that's the De Youth Diabetes Daily podcast. Yes, um, that's a project. And we've also brought a trailer with us to which we would like to show to you because uh, maybe you get the feeling of what it's like, what the Do You podcast is like. Okay. And yes, we can show it right Let's now. Let's have a look. Me. Wonderful. Let's have a look. Hello, everyone. My name is Anna, Anna. Julia, Marieva, Madalena, Lazar, and, and we are Do You. welcomes you to the new episode of the Diabetes Daily Podcast. Enjoy! Hello! Hello! hello. We are the we are youth. youth! Hi everyone! So, hello everyone! Hello! Hello! Hello everyone! Hey everyone! I am Anna, I am 20 years old and I'm from Italy. My name is uh, Lazar. I am 24 years old and I come from uh, Bor in Serbia. My name is Marieva. I am 22 years old. I'm from Greece. I live in Athens. My name is Madalena. I'm 21 years old. I'm from Portugal. I'm Linda and I'm 27 years old and I'm from Germany. I am Julia. I am from Hungary and I live in Budapest. I am 25. I have had diabetes type 1 for 9 years now. And I have diabetes for a little more than 2 years. I have diabetes for 5 years. Diabetes has been with me for 15 years. I have diabetes since I'm 19, so it's for 7 years now, I think. And I have diabetes since I was 12, so it's been 13 years now. At first, I wasn't scared at all. Since I was in school, I ever wanted to move countries, so to live abroad for a while. I think my power is my family, my friends, my boyfriend, and above all, myself. I would like to have a day with people with diabetes, like have a spot that we hang out specific day, specific hour and talk about, I don't know, it's, you know, it's so different to be with other people with diabetes. I would like that, I would like that so much. To this day, I do not think diabetes creates barriers in my life. I think uh, barriers are normal for everyone in every life. They are necessary just to keep going, to keep fighting. I'm really proud of myself that I got you know, to this point and that I will move on, that I will go on, you know, and I'm really proud of my team and of all the people that are helping me like every day. And, you know, I think that you are doing a really great job and whatever you do, just keep doing it and, you know, the world will be a better place. Actually, this that's because we have you. Welcome, 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 welcome to you. the youth. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. 
Oh, that is so fantastic. And and there's a QR code there so that people can can follow along. How brilliant. That's just so wonderful. So I'll so throw a, a question open and I'm sorry that if I've sort of jumped in and, and moved around who was answering <laughs> what, but maybe um, the question, I guess, is, you know, how's, how's this being received so far? Are you having some good feedback? Have you got people really excited about it so far? Uh, well, yes, yes, people uh, people are amazed by it, and uh, we are. Uh, so now you, you have seen, like, the first season. It's all our episodes. Uh, so we are preparing for some special episodes, and uh, we are preparing uh, for new seasons. So the way that you can participate is that uh, you can apply. Uh, we want to hear your story, we want to hear uh, your voice, and we want to connect to uh, the all, all the people from all around the world, uh, because we, we are so excited, and um, that idea was born not so long ago, but it's growing really fast, and it's, uh, it's kind of really amazing, and I really hope that you feel this, this energy, and that will uh, you will recognize it and that you will participate absolutely feeling the energy uh, absolutely how how fantastic and what a great initiative this is really really terrific are there any sort of last words that either of you would like to say to sort of wrap up for world diabetes day why don't i start with you linda is there anything any parting words or anything else that you'd like to talk about the podcast um the podcast lives for from the participation because it's a collaborative podcast um, and we need people who would like to share their stories and I think everybody can share his or her story because everybody has a unique life. We all have diabetes but we all have different experiences with uh, our lives with diabetes and it's so um, powerful to share and experience uh, to share the experiences and I would really uh, encourage you all to um, participate in our podcast to keep this project alive that's so wonderful and we are so passionate about it that it was so so super <laughs> wonderful and lazar is there any are there any last things you'd like to say perhaps make sure that everybody's really aware of where they can follow along and um and, and get involved uh yes first uh, from the youth thank you for this amazing opportunity uh, if you recognize it, uh, so we have Instagram account, we have many different social accounts, you can find us there and you can um, apply so we can hear your story. And as we say at the end of every episode, uh, we wish you a good blood sugar. Well, that's yes. it. I wish the same to both of you as well. Um, but thank you so, so much for joining us. I cannot wait to, to jump on and listen to the podcast. I know that that's exactly what I'm going to be doing as I am working tomorrow. So thank you so much for joining us. Good luck with it moving forward. Uh, and, uh, yeah, may I, I'll, I'll wish you a good blood sugar as well. And, uh, and we'll move on. thank you so much. Enjoy the rest thank of your you. work. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, this is where I get to sound like an old mother hen for a minute, but I'm going to do it anyway and just say, gosh, the kids are all right. Um, look, earlier today I was at an, hosting an event and we um, here in Melbourne in Australia and we had um, a, a panel of, um, of, of future leaders and every single time I hear people who are involved in um, the, the youth leadership program here with IDFE or these young people that I was speaking with tonight, it's so exciting to see see the projects and the initiatives that people are doing and, you know, what a brilliant opportunity World Diabetes Day is to showcase these sorts of things. But clearly there's a lot happening on days that are not World Diabetes Day as well. So please do make sure you all go and have a listen to the podcast and get involved there. All right, I'm going to now introduce um, Paco Orengo, who is going to talk about something that is very, very close to very, very many of our hearts. It's very blue. It involves balloons and it's a challenge. And yes, we are going to be talking about the Blue Balloon Challenge. So we'll just wait for Paco to join us. The, oh, look at you, right on message with a balloon. I, I forgot my prompt. How are you? Happy World Diabetes Day. Happy World Diabetes Day. Thank you very much, Ransa. Thank you to the rest of the team and the presenters. It has been amazing so far. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm so pleased that you're here. Now, look, if in case somebody has been hide, hiding under a rock or a red balloon or something and they don't know what's going on, tell us what the Blue Balloon Challenge is, please. Yes, of course. Yes. So, well, this uh, movement, uh, I think uh, now we can call it, uh, 
started to, to just to create awareness around diabetes in general and how invisible it is. And I think uh, thanks to people like you guys here and, and other uh, special partners that we have been having along the way, we are making this mission of making this, you know, invisible conditions many times more visible a reality and it's just one of many tools and, and, and another excuse to really have something to do with it physically to really show that it's something that we should be talking more and uh, about and it's something that it should be just more present uh, everywhere and i think the blue balloon challenge is trying to make that metaphor of diabetes you know juggling all the time with uh, your your levels uh, more visible for the regular person to understand how challenging mm -hmm. sometimes is to to do it. So yeah, we are again in a, in the third round of this blue balloon challenge. Let's say, and uh, yeah, this is just the starting. Absolutely, and I can I can tell you I, I can't open Instagram these days without being absolutely inundated with people doing the blue balloon challenge. You know, they're they're showing what it is like to try and sit there at their laptop and get work done or cook dinner and well, you know, with the balloon and and all these sorts of things with the balloon representing the ever presence um, of of diabetes. It really is a useful metaphor to explain to people about how there is so much like w even with everything going on, diabetes still has to be taken care of so it it, it really is a, an effective way of getting that but it's not just about people playing with blue, blue balloons and then putting it on social media there, there's something really powerful behind it could you tell us about yeah. the um the you know the the, the, the incredibly generous donation or, or contribution from um, medtronic to life for a child yes uh, yes exactly thank you so yeah to connect it even more or or beyond the awareness phase yeah uh, we wanted to encourage people to feel like they really make a difference even though awareness it by itself is, is is already very important but yeah with every participation using the hashtag blue balloon challenge uh, on social media uh Metronic will be donating five euros to life for a child and well the impact that they create uh, with the money that you know they, they receive from here and there is just amazing i know they are here also after me so i will yes. then, uh, you know i will let them do the talk about that but you know we are super happy to see that you know the the movement is also turning something more tangible that is actually helping a lot of people all over the world so yeah i mean yeah try to spread the word and 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 do the social uh, the social challenge the social media um blue balloon challenge and for every participation there will be a donation in your name let's say yeah. so yeah now each year there is a hero video if you like a, about the campaign that people can share that explains what it is and i think we're going to show it in just a minute so that we can see what what that is about and show everybody so perhaps let's show that now and then we'll have another quick chat with just a couple more questions afterwards but um our, our team in the studio is teeing that up right now so that we can see it um i know that the campaign videos in previous years have been just so powerful um you know not only just to get the message across of what the challenge is but really to also you know be a great awareness um raising activity for um you know for for diabetes so are we ready to go with that in a minute it really helps when we're all in the same place but i'm here in melbourne and uh everyone's everywhere else but let's go morgan's saying yes so let's see that video Living with diabetes is like doing everything you do in your daily life while keeping a balloon in the air. It's a constant balancing act. Diabetes doesn't care who you are, what you do, or where you live. From the very young to the young at heart, it's a challenge. So we are making it our mission to help people understand what it's really like to live with diabetes through the lens of different stories every year. This year, we're sharing the voices of young people it can be difficult sometimes, but every day is different depending on how you manage it. When I'm low, people will say you had too much sugar. And when I'm high, they'll ask whether I need sugar to treat it. And that's the complete opposite of what I need. There are so many people like you. You are not alone. Everyone has their own thing to do. And you'll have your own way of dealing with things. D1D, you, you won't stop me. 
So help us make the invisible visible. Take part in the Blue Balloon Challenge and Medtronic will donate five euros to Life for a Child for every post. Medtronic, Life for a Child and DDoc, it seems like an incredibly powerful union that we have there to raise awareness, for there to be some funds involved to support people uh, with diabetes in under-resourced countries. It is such a, a brilliant campaign to be, um, you know, focusing on, on World Diabetes Day. Have you got any last words for us before we bring in some of our Life for a Child team to talk about that? Well, just a huge thank you because what started as a idea let's say of a metaphor how to represent this has started to move all around the world and we see every day more and more activations and uh, representations of the blue balloon the blue balloon has you know it's not no longer uh, uh, an idea only uh, it's a reality and i see the blue balloon in, pl in places that i i just cannot believe so i think this is really helping us uh, and again uh, the whole community to make this thing uh, you know diabetes in this case uh, more visible and just thank you and yeah if, you know yeah. keep going <laughs> Make the invisible visible. I mean, we know that diabetes is, is such an invisible condition. What a great, great way to, to bring it out there to the fore and have people talking about it. Paco, thank you so much. I know you've got a super busy the rest of your day. I can't even imagine what you've already done up until this time. But thank you so much for, for joining us. I'm going to now introduce um, Emma Clapman from Life for a Child, and she'll be joined by Tino, um, who... Oh, Tino, just honestly, but before we bring Tino on, Emma, like, how are you? Happy World Diabetes Day to you. <laughs> Thank you, Renza. And Have so you, how's your day, day been? It's actually not, I've not had so much of a day so far. I'm in Chicago at the moment, so okay. it's a very timid, almost 10 a.m., so there's <laughs> a lot more ahead. Um with all the different time zones, it's like we have a, I feel like it's a couple of world diabetes days in one, but um, yes, it's yes. been a lot of prep up to this point, um, but yes. I couldn't be, you know, happier to be marking another world diabetes day. And for me this year, the theme, I guess, for me, just on a personal level is around friendship. Um, I'm not always grateful for my type one diabetes, but I am this year in a lot of ways because every year, you know, meeting different people in this space surprise, you know, it, it surprises me in ways that I don't expect. And I am just so grateful for, for the friends I have made in this community in the last year. They've kept me going and uh, they connect me to something that, that feels great and important. And it's just lovely to be here this year. Oh, Emma, and I know that so many people, you know, I, I am always hearing people speaking about your work and about, you know, just how valuable you are in, in the community and, and how much people value that friendship from you as well. So absolutely understand the value of that and how important it is. But we've just heard from Paco from Metronic talking about the Blue Balloon Challenge. Um, is, is part of your day going to involve walking down the street with a blue balloon? Um, <laughs> that's my first question to you. Tell me you're going to go to your local cafe with a blue balloon and I don't know sit there you know while the barista is making your coffee I'm gonna do some I'm gonna do something with it the the bean in Chicago is closed otherwise I would have been there reflecting it um but right. uh yeah definitely definitely will will be in yeah. some way tell me about you know for life for a child the blue balloon challenge and just how important those sorts of initiatives are i mean it is such a really 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 big and important pro um uh campaign at this time of year isn't it in the community absolutely and um i don't i don't think that i need to remind anyone of this but i usually i usually do every year um I, I think that, you know, as I was saying earlier, I think that in so many ways, diabetes is a common thread that that unites those with lived experience in vastly different parts of the world. But having, you know, the experience of having type 1 diabetes in a low or lower middle income country 
can, you know, the, the reality is that it can unfortunately, very unfortunately and unfairly impact a wide range of health outcomes in a very inequitable way um, amongst those living with diabetes and their families and, and also those who care for them, their healthcare professionals. And that's really fundamentally because health systems in these settings um, really do struggle to provide basic diabetes care to those in need due yeah. to competing health priorities and, and constrained health, health budgets. But, you know, so while the ingredients for diabetes management um, can look similarly globally, no matter their location, um, sometimes we have to remind ourselves that type one diabetes isn't always the great equalizer uniting us, but this really is where life for a child steps in. And um, that's so great to see uh, Janina commenting. Um, Janina is from Guatemala and she leads um, one of the centers that, that we support in Guatemala. And so mm -hmm. this is very timely because, you know, this is where life for a child steps in and we have been going strong since the early 2000s and have been steadily expanding the care that we are able to provide um, pediatric diabetes centers globally ever since. And so um, I can tell you now we are supporting around 48,000 young people across the globe in around 45 countries. And, and last year when I spoke, um, at the last World Diabetes Day, uh, we were supporting around 34,000. So we've had a massive increase in the last year, in the last 12 months. And um, our vision 2030 is that we're able to reach around 150,000 young people uh, by 2030. So we, we are well on our way to achieving our goals. Um, yeah. uh, and, you know, the ways in which we work are that we strengthen health facilities that already exist within countries. You know, you'll never go to uh, a country or a center that we support and find a life for a child clinic. We are all about empowering the local capacity. And, and on the subject of the Blue Balloon Challenge, the last two years have just been so enormous for us in terms of of the growth that you know that that we have experienced and the awareness that we've been able to generate and we're so grateful words you know fail fail us uh to uh generate and really find the words to to thank and acknowledge the diabetes online community our our awareness has mushroomed since the challenge began and we've been able to provide diabetes supplies to regions in need. Um, and particularly in the last year, we've been able to support um, uh, diabetes centers in Kenya and in Syria. And really what, um, why the Blue Balloon Challenge has been so important for us is that it ensures that we're able to do what we do for years to come. The campaign is helping us secure funding for direct support and it is also about ensuring that we can continue to encourage sustainability through research and advocacy. And um, I'll just pause there because the next thing I'd like to talk about uh, is about advocacy. But let me, let me know when I can go there. Well, we're thrilled that you are going to be doing that. I, I, do, I will just say though that Life for a Child is so, so precious and dear to the hearts of so many people within our community. So thank you to you and the team for all the work that you're doing, for being such an incredibly important part of the community, for sharing and telling us about the work that you're doing as well. All that ever does is generate, you know, want people to be more involved and to learn more about it. So I'm always so excited that, that when we get to hear you here at GDOC or anywhere else talking about the incredible work. But it's not just about what you've spoken about already. There's new stuff happening all the time. So I think Tino's going to join us now because you're just going to talk about something super interesting. Tino, hello. Happy World Hi. Diabetes Day again. Happy World Diabetes Day, you know, again. Yes. We've been on we, several calls already. We were talking something like, I don't know, 16 hours ago, I think, was the first time we said hi to each other on World Diabetes Day. So it's been a, a big day for you as well. But, Emma, talk to us about um, about the latest thing from Life for a Child, about Changemaker. What is it? Who is it? Who's involved? <laughs> Thanks. 
Um, so yes, this is on the subject of advocacy, and I'm so feel so fortunate to be here with my friend Tina Owen. You know, on the subject of friendships, I'm I'm so lucky to 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 be able to now call Tino a friend and. I've obviously known Tino from a distance over the years, but I've really gotten to know him over the past few months. And he's been collaborating with us at Life for a Child on the Changemaker projects that you mentioned. So it's very exciting news. And today we launched the biggest advocacy endeavor that Life for a Child has embarked on to date. Um, it's involved months of work coming to life today. Um, and for me, both, you know, orchestrating with uh, the team at Life for a Child, the Changemaker Projects, and I also will be mentoring a Changemaker myself, feels very much like closing a circle for me. Um, I, start, I started my journey in diabetes advocacy as a girl. I was maybe a little more unafraid, maybe a little bolder, maybe a little more untempered by the fear of being told no or that my passions or ideas were too big. But today, you know, as an advocate myself, I'm here because of the belief that, you know, mentors placed in me growing up and their belief translated into capacity building of my own advocacy skill set and legitimize my own lived experience in this space. Um, so I feel a lot of pride in being able to inspire a ripple effect in, in the next round of change makers to come. So um, we launched an open call for applications for the Life for a Child Change Maker project, uh, the projects in August. And our aim in this call for applications was to provide opportunities to build advocacy capacity for individuals impacted by type 1 diabetes in uh, countries that Life for a Child support in Latin America and Africa. And this follows on from advocacy work on human rights that, that we've done uh, in collaboration with communities there. So I might just pass to Tino a second before I talk about the, the change makers and applicants. And Tino, um, Maybe you'd like to explain a little about yourself and explain how you got involved in the Changemaker projects as a mentor yourself. Great, thank you so much. I think that's a great question, the way you're asking it. Okay, so briefly, I'm Tino, um, patient advocate like myself, or should I say global advocate. And now uh, collaborating with so many, so many people, creating the spaces and also trying to level the ground to make sure that people do get the opportunities that I've gotten uh, because they might not hear about them because probably people are not subjective on social media, the thing that I got to be in. I got to know so many, so many things that have been happening. So a huge thanks to the Life Reach Out and by Life Reach Out, I mean to you, Emma, and the team working behind the scenes for reaching out to me and recognizing my work as a professional advocate so that I could help. Uh, just like what Bastian always said, he says, I've been helped so I want to pay it forward. So I want to help somebody because I've been helped, I've been assisted, and somebody else there needs that too. So yeah, I'm here and I'm super excited to be part of this. Amazing. You know, I'll just say the enthusiasm when you joined um, us on screen, I'm just looking at the comments and, and there, there is such love for you from the community because you just do so much and people are, you know, you're so visible with all the incredible things that you're doing. So uh, it, it doesn't surprise me when there is this, you know, I, I, it's like a, a, a an online applause sort of thing of people screaming Tino. So Emma, but I'll throw it back to you to talk more about the Changemaker pro uh, project. Sure. And, um, you know, just on the subject of back to Tino, I think um, we have to be really conscious of the lanes that we we traditionally might think of putting advocates in advocates should be mentors to other advocates. And I think, you know, what I was saying about circles closing, um, yes, I'm a mentor for the Changemaker Project myself. I've been involved, of course, with orchestrating it. But I still, you know, I, I'm, I've been an advocate, you know, most of my life when it comes to diabetes care. Um, but I, I'm still in need of, of mentorship myself. And that circle never fully closes. It's just important that we keep moving, that we all keep moving within that circle. 
Yeah. And and just um, back to the, um, I, I, I'm really eager to explain who the change makers actually are. Um, but, but we actually received around 200 uh, applications oh. from dozens of countries. So it was an incredibly hard task um, selecting eight at applicants. Um, and it's very important that, you know, we at Life for a Child acknowledge value and recognize the effort put into those who applied. And, you know, there is so much potential to empower future change makers to create lasting and sustainable difference for diabetes in their, in their settings. And I just like to say that we believe in the potential of every person who who shares our dedication to improving the situation of people living with with diabetes. Um, Morgan, could I have you on the screen just show? Yes, um, exactly that. So <laughs> on the screen, you're looking at uh, the eight selected change makers and you'll just see uh, also um, uh, a URL additionally. Um, so please do check out this link and follow these amazing eight change makers on their social accounts. And I'd just like to run through briefly uh, the list of, of um, selected change that makers. Would be great. We have Morgan, if you could go back to that screen, we have um, an individual from Madagascar just on the left. His name is Jerry. Uh, he'll be working on awareness of psych psychological and social support in universities in Madagascar. Um, we have on the right Queen from Ghana, who is taking on a human rights angle in advocating for the rights of people living with uh, type 1 diabetes. We also have uh, Dr. Thierry uh, from Burundi. Um, who will be working on social and educational integration in rural settings, in particular in Burundi. We have George Kwayu from Tanzania, who will be working on schools and advocacy uh, initiatives. We have Renata Velez from Mexico, who will be working on strengthening um, the social media landscape nationally uh, in Mexico to increase awareness of type 1 diabetes. We have Luis Baird from Dominican Republic who will be working on an incredible program of uh, parent um, men mentorship for recently diagnosed um, parents uh, of children with, with um, type 1 diabetes. And really each of these fantastic change makers have been matched with a mentor. Um, and obviously Tino is a mentor and I know Mariana Gomez is on this call as well. We're also so fortunate and lucky and joyful to have Mariana joining as a mentor. Um, but Tino will be matched with um, uh, Dr. Peter Masindi, who is from Tanzania and Peter uh, grew up as the um, older brother of uh, his sister who had type 1 diabetes. He's a recent graduate from the Muhambili University Faculty of Medicine, and he's really um, passionate about uh, bridging the gap between complex research uh, and those who actually live with, with type 1 diabetes. Um, so, I'd love Tino to, to touch on why he's excited about mentoring Peter. I can just say I thought it was a match made in heaven for the both of them as there's just so there's so much room for cross collaboration of advocates who have different skill sets and we can all lift each other up um, in this way. Um, so Tino. Um, I know that you're yet to, to meet Peter and so many things will develop and change, but any words on uh, why you particularly are excited for Peter's project? And I know you have spoken for quite some time now, but allow me, allow me uh, to ask. Already we know that like Life Witch Out has been doing amazing work and they're still doing amazing work. But allow me to ask you, like, what was the motivation to start this initiative before I answer your question? So, yeah, if you can do that. 30 seconds, please. I love the way that Tino oh, wow. himself. I love it. He, goes, he goes into interviewer mode. But that's a very good question. What were the motivations behind this? 
Love it. Um, I think, you know, I, if, if I have 30 seconds to answer this, I think, you know, fundamentally at Life for a Child, we believe that change starts with people and especially people affected by diabetes are often uh, the best individuals to be at the forefront of change given their natural skills uh, in resilience and problem solving. The issue is that I think, you know, there's no shortage of goodwill amongst uh, global diabetes organizations in, you know, wanting to um, meaningfully engage people living with diabetes, but not everyone is a born advocate. And I think that's an important um, assumption to dispel. And it's so important to, of course, funding is very important for those with an advocacy vision in their settings. but. Um, it's so deeply important, we think, to uh, build capacity skills and provide those mentoring and networking opportunities to, to give the best possible uh, platform for, for individuals to make change, um, lasting change. And also, I think another angle is that we're really passionate about legitimizing the expertise and experience of people affected by diabetes. But it do, you know, you don't just click your fingers and get there. You have to focus on, you know, building the landscape. And, and that's really what our motivation is here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emma. So let me jump straight to answer briefly your question about why I'm so excited to do this, what I'm, what I'm going to be doing, what I'm looking forward to be doing together with Peter, working together collaboration. So I believe myself um, as some of a number of professional advocates, and there are so many people that I still look up to, but I cannot call out their names now, because if I leave others, others might be offended. So I'm not going to do that. But I look up to you. Just know that. Right. So as an advocate and also as a content creator myself, I believe with what Peter's project aims to do to sort of like try to disseminate the research so that people do have an understanding, especially the people, because we believe all this research is also meant for people living with diabetes. Like recently, about why another or a recent author once said that people with diabetes always need to ask researchers what their research means to them. So Peter's project now is aims to sort of like cut across, trying to open, trying to, to study more, to say, okay, fine, really, what does this, it definitely matches, and I know both of you are also part of the project that Jazz is doing, uh, decoding the diabetes information, and it's way too much similar with this. And I know whenever I've been writing some, what do you call it, as I was trying to pay it forward, writing articles, people would say, wow, I think we love the way you sort of like simplify terms, because I cannot really just write these jargons, medical jargons for people to understand. They will not be because you cannot be reading an article and then going to Google to ask what that word means. So trying to simplify this word things, uh, because I believe to date we have made so much progress in terms of diabetes uh, researching um, and also trying to find information and stuff like that. But maybe it might not be really helpful or impactful or applicable to the people if they do not understand, if they have to sort of like go back and forth trying to find what it means. So I think I'm super excited to be doing this with Peter because also as a person who has a wide variety, somebody who has learned so much from these extraordinary diabetes conferences. So this is something that I see, we can see that how it relates and why it is important for people because now we are talking about it. And I also know that I think if JS was here, she would be smiling, hearing me. But of course, since you're also part of it, you know how it is, how important it is to simplify these medical things because people need to understand, not just people with diabetes, not just caregivers, but also uh, medical doctors, even junior doctors that might be doing this. Because really I cannot say, I can say that it's not really about research uh, obsolete, but we can talk of research inadequacy because the information that people need to understand, the things that they should be able to grasp, they cannot do that because it's not really simple for them to understand. So yeah. With all being said, I would say that is why I'm super, super excited to be doing this with Peter, which I'm going to meet very soon. Thank you. How lucky is Peter to be working with you? Emma and Tina, I'm really hoping that what we're going to see at Future Doc Days is, uh, you know, a progress update on how the Changemaker project is going, about the Changemakers, 
hearing from them and hearing about their projects because I have a feeling that there's going to be some absolutely amazing things happening there that we will want to hear about um, and to be able to platform um, what they're doing. But have you got, Emma, I'll start with you. Have you got any last words? Because we're going to hold on to Tina. We've got other questions for him. But is there anything you'd like to add before um, before we ask Tina about a different project? Um, just that, you know, we do, none of us have a crystal ball and we don't know what the future will look like. But I, for one, am just so excited about the, the, the positive uh, turns that this will take. You know, I'm, I'm hopeful that change makers themselves will come on uh, doc days and explain themselves what, what they have been up to. And I think the potential for South-South collaborations is really exciting as well, you know, hearing what Tino was mentioning about jazz set at uh, jazz set these decoded. Yeah. There's so many prospects for a future collaboration and I'm excited to see where it goes. And thank you, Tino, for for strengthening this this project and thank you, uh, D Doc, for giving us the platform to explain the impact of the Blue Balloon Challenge, how important that is to us organizationally and uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk about change makers and my own advocacy journey. So thank you for an excellent way to start World Diabetes Day for me. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of it. Go get a coffee. Um, Emma, as ever, it is so, we are so, so fortunate that you give your time to speak with us to update us on what's being done. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about the rest of your World Diabetes Day. I'll have a look at that and see what's going on on your socials to see that. But uh, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing. But Tino, don't you jump off just yet because talk to me. You've got other projects on the go and I believe there's a specific hospital project that you are involved in at the moment you want to share with us all. Oh, thank you so much for that question, Brenda. So, uh, like... Since I got diagnosed in 2010 and I met with this amazing, amazing pediatrist, that was my doctor then. And to date, since then, I've never been back in the hospital. He just told me, hey, if you're feeling okay, you don't necessarily have to come back here to see me, that kind of thing. So when I went back, I think 10 years later, to see him again, I had, of course, there was that this other connection that we had. And then sharing to him sort of like my testimony to say i've been doing a b c d and i've met so many other people now i'm attending conferences and i'm learning so many things and i was eager to learn also to become a certified diabetes educator that's when he approached the clinical director to say hey i think we need you know to be coming to our hospital speaking with people living with diabetes and also to the parents giving them assurance because he has achieved so many things and diabetes was not sort of like the end for him. So he's doing so many things. So now I go to the hospital, speaking with people living with diabetes and their parents during the outpatient clinics visits and also train, helping to consult doctors uh, just from my background of attending conferences. So many things to do for that. I get so much things that they might not have access to. So I get to help them. And I mean, it's just a mutual thing and everything is just going naturally because of yeah. the things that I'm knowing now. So yeah, that's briefly about these initiatives. I, I, I just have to ask because every time I speak to you or see you speaking about something, you're doing more. There's something else that you have added to the list. How do you, where do you find time for Tino and for, for you know, do, do you have downtime? Do you have time where it's just you sitting there peacefully and thinking about yourself or you just are so involved in so many things? Somebody referred to you as like the global advocate before or the heart of global advocacy, I think is what they said. And that just feels and is so, so true. But, uh, you know, how much more are you going to be able to take on? Well, I believe... I'm, I've been inspired and I think what pushes me is really this, the passion that I have is that I joined in the advocacy journey at a later stage, at a later age. So I thought maybe I needed to do so much more, not to compete with anybody, but to collaborate, get inspiration, drawing encouragement from other people, uh, peer support, uh, that's what we talked about. 
So since everybody else seems to be doing so many things, so I thought maybe if I could learn from these international conferences and also maybe take it back home, because yes, of course, I feel like the things that I thought could be my hobby uh, is now sort of like becoming the main thing that I have to focus on, especially if I have to be working on a podcast. It takes so much of my time. So, but basically that's how things have been going and stuff like that. Oh, about the light. I'm sorry about that. That's right. Tino, thank you so, so much for joining us today. I do appreciate it. I appreciate you joining um, us in other opportunities, you know, in other um, doc days as well. You're always so welcome to share the work that you're doing and we're always so pleased to hear it, to see you at conferences and, and sharing and, you know, you really do, you know, the spirit of pay it forward uh, lives in you. So thank you so, so much. Um, you do inspire so many of us. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Brenda. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye-bye. Tino really is one of the hardest, the hardest working advocate in the diabetes community. I say that all the time and I genuinely do mean it. His work is so impactful and important. I'm now going to be joined by um, Mohammed Siam, who is going to be talking with us about the situation for people with diabetes in Gaza. I know that this is a topic that people um, have been asking about. They are truly interested to know how people in Gaza with diabetes, what is going on there. And Mohammed, I'm really pleased that you are able to join me today. Hello, how are you? Let's start with that question. Well, thank you so much, Franza. Thank you. First of all, first of all, thank you so much for having me today. And uh, um, I believe I'm doing well. I'm trying my very best, of course, uh, throughout these kind of hard times and challenging times for uh, for my people to support people. And again, uh, maybe seeing Tino, Tino's Tino, and listening to his words uh, minutes just a few minutes ago uh, kind of boosted my mood a little bit. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate him talking and I really appreciate the work that we all do in the global diabetes community to to support each other and to ensure that uh, every person living with diabetes uh, gets the chance to to live a happy, fulfilling life, to advocate, to to be part of, of this amazing United community uh, itself. Yeah, absolutely. And you're such an important part of our DDoc Voices community and the broader diabetes community as well. Um, we're going to talk today about what the situation is for people with diabetes, but also what people at home can do to support um, people in Gaza and, and also, you know, I think that for a lot of people, they feel that there's nothing that they can do. But I'm so pleased that you're here to share some of those tangible things that people can do. So let's start with talking about, you know, what do you know about the situation in Gaza at the moment? Um, you know, what is it that you would like to share with us today? Yeah. Um, well, I'd just like to start by saying that living with diabetes itself is, is, is challenging. And we all know this. We all go through um uh, through tough decisions every day, maybe uh, like thousands of extra thoughts. Um, how many units of insulin do I take? How do I measure my food? And what do I do every day? And that by itself is challenging, even if we have uh, the, I'd say the privilege of techno diabetes technologies and the supplies that we always uh, use uh, in our daily life with diabetes. And this is kind of a, a way for me to bathe uh, the way or paint a picture on how uh, would someone uh, living with diabetes uh, manage their condition in, in such challenging times and during a humanitarian crisis where their access to um, supplies, resources, education is, is very limited. Now, uh, living with diabetes in Gaza, uh, and I've been there myself. Now, I'm I'm not in the Gaza Strip at the moment. Um, I'm, just, I'm just like I've just left like a few months ago. But uh, living with diabetes in Gaza itself, even during quote unquote peaceful time, is 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 challenging uh, with the very limited access to resources, to the education, to supplies, and through advocacy, we've been trying for years to support people living with diabetes in Gaza. And a lot of people here in in, uh, in this call uh, know know a lot about our advocacy uh, journey in, in in Gaza. Uh, and thanks to to Emma, she spoke about Life for a Child and their off and their efforts in 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 in, in many countries around the world. And Palestine is one of those countries. Life for a Child have been uh, a great support for for the diabetes community in in the Gaza Strip and. Uh, uh, throughout our advocacy, we've been able to contribute to uh, access to uh, supplies, insulin, and uh, education to a lot of people living with diabetes, but more specifically, type 1 diabetes in the Gaza Strip. 
Now, with the ongoing uh, humanitarian crisis in the Gaza Strip and the aggression on, uh, on people of, of the Gaza Strip, uh, people living with diabetes find it really challenging and complicating to, to manage their conditions. And that could be uh, simply if we talk about the, the fear, the stress, the lack of sleep that they go through that would make it really kind of impossible for them to manage their condition. And um, the ongoing power cuts that they, they go through where they don't know how to store the insulin or how can they make sure that their insulin lasts enough for them uh, throughout those days. Um, people, people living with diabetes in Gaza have no access to, to insulin at the moment because the borders are closed, no humanitarian aid is going, is going into the Gaza Strip and the resources that the healthcare system, the collapsed healthcare system is having at the moment are very limited. And therefore, um, I personally know a lot of people with diabetes in Gaza at the moment who are rationing their insulin just for, 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 for the insulin to last a little bit longer. A lot of them are changing the types of insulin that they used to have or they used to inject themselves with to new types or the, the types that are available um, at the primary healthcare centers where they could get insulin. But almost half of the primary healthcare centers in the Gaza Strip are now closed uh, at out of service because of what's going on and people can't go to um, consult a doctor or see uh, uh, or get a prescription. So uh, mostly they would just go to the refuge centers or uh, the school, the honorable schools, the UN schools in the Gaza Strip, where they have kind of a room for supplies, the medical supplies, and they'll get their insulin from there uh, based on what's available or what's, uh, what they could get uh, from, from there. Now, with, with it being very hard to manage the condition, of course, it would mean that people with diabetes are more susceptible to hyperglycemias and they can't even test their blood glucose levels on a regular regular basis because they don't have uh, strips and, and, and enough uh, and enough supplies. So um, I was just I was just talking to, to a friend of mine this morning and he told me that he only tests one every one time every three days just to uh, to, to imagine how 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 hard it is for him to to get his hands on supplies and to get his hands on on on, on strips, um, uh, and with being more susceptible to hyperglycemia, this means that you need to drink more water. And now access to food and drinkable water in the Gaza Strip is even more limited, and the scarcity of resources all around this trip is uh, is a burden, is an extra burden for everyone. And of course, it's, a, it's, it's much more of a bigger burden for people living with type 1 diabetes. Uh, without insulin, you'd need to, uh, you'd need to be um, an inpatient in, in, a, in a hospital. You need to visit an ER. And if, 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 you could, if you're having a diabetic ketoacidosis, you'd need an ICU bed. And with the ongoing situation, with the mass casualties, the, the, again, the collapsed healthcare system is dealing with, we're talking about no ICU beds and, and a patient with type 1 diabetes who we all know without insulin would simply die um, now can't even go to a hospital to get the proper treatment and the proper management that they deserve as, as a human beings as, as, and, and as people um, of the Gazan community and they can't uh, enter an ICU bed or be, be admitted an ICU bed uh, because we have shortage of ICU beds at the moment because of the because of the mass casualties. Um, but um, with this kind of brief overview about the situation uh, of, of people with diabetes in the Gaza Strip, I, I, I can tell you how advocacy could help and how important yes. it is. Because yes. advocacy has supported and has helped people with diabetes in the Gaza Strip before, and it will continue doing so in Gaza and in other parts of the world. Uh, even with the simplest things that we could do by, by posting about diabetes in Gaza, by, by sharing it to to our friends, to our family, to anybody close to us, or by, for example, writing a letter to, to our congressman, to, to the parliament in, in my country, to the people who are decision makers and policy makers in, my, in our countries, just to support them or put more pressure on them to support people going or ongoing the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, opening the borders, or uh, at least getting the humanitarian aid that is waiting in, in the convoys in the Egyptian shop, in the, on the Egyptian side of the Rafah crossing. And that is uh, the spirit of the diabetes community. That is what makes me always say that I'm, I'm, I can't be more prouder uh, to be part of the diabetes community because I know that we were always there for each other. We support each other. We understand each other. We feel for each other. And it, it only takes kind of an ounce of humanity for, for, each, for each of us to feel for uh, others' uh, ongoing crises around the world 
such a, even if it's uh, that, that even if we're now talking about Gaza, but this those crises that are crises around the world are happening in different parts of the world, and again, it is a, a kind of a moral responsibility for us to talk about uh, people uh, with diabetes all around the world to share their voices, to to be their voices, and to to amplify uh, the support that we could get or we could give for those people. Uh, in order to uh, to support them in living a happy, fulfilling, healthy life, and uh, this is this is the message that what that we we all care about in in the, in the diabetes community. We care for each other, we support each other, and we want every person living with diabetes around the globe to uh, to live a happy, fulfilling life. Uh, throughout a lot of um, advocacy um, campaigns, mainly right now at the moment, uh, we're doing uh, um, what we call the Diabetes Humanitarian Aid Coalition. Uh, you could find that on social media. We're mailing a lot of policymakers, a lot of international organizations. We're following up. We're supporting uh, in any way we can to to ensure and to make sure that we connect the dots. And again, we amplify the voices of advocates across the globe to to support the needs um, of diabetes in, in, in Gaza. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Mo. I know that there are, um, and we've just seen it in the comments that are coming through, is people are desperate to help. They they want to help. Um, and at this stage, it is about contacting um, local members of parliament. It is doing that sort of advocacy. There is real power in that, though, isn't there? I, I feel that a lot of the time people don't understand how loud the collective voice is but their own voice as well is 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 really really important to, to add to that choir is that one of the the most important things that can be happening right yes. now well definitely because this yeah. is the least that we can do this is the only kind of possible way to support at the moment because yeah. we can't for example just get donations or get supplies into the gaza strip at the moment yes. because of the closed borders because it's like there's no way in or out of the gaza strip right now but we can do is just keep putting pressure on those policy makers to, to, to ensure that our voices are heard and that the actions must be taking, taken to support uh, people with diabetes uh, in the Gaza Strip. A lot of people could could just think or assume that, oh, my voice doesn't matter, but it would yeah. def it definitely matters a lot. And Absolutely. Um, yeah, if, if, if we collectively keep talking, keep posting, keep advocating, keep raising awareness about the, 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 the situation of, of people living with diabetes in the Gaza Strip, this would mean that it's kind of a collective voice, it's a louder voice, and it would reach uh, higher places yeah. and, and, and definitely get us where we want to be, uh, hopefully in the very near future in the coming days. Absolutely. And I can say it takes no time at all. I know this, our foreign minister here in Australia has a dedicated phone line for people to call and to register how they're feeling and what they want the government to do. So please, everybody, have a look at what your governments are doing and how you can access and how you can contact people immediately, yes. But I think what you've said there is really important. We ha we do know that the diabetes community steps up. The, the, the first thing that, that I thought of was, right, wh where do I donate? How, who do I send things to? But at the moment, that may not be what we need to do. We need this is about organising. This is about um, you know using that voice to to go to MPs. We're seeing huge, huge rallies of support. Um, you know, people joining joining things like that. That's also really important, isn't it? Is that that because that's part of the political pressure, isn't it? Definitely, of course, yes, indeed. Uh, this is this is again. This is what we could do at the moment. Uh, you, we can just for, again send supplies right now. Uh, so the only choice we have at the moment is to speak up, to use our voices and to use every matter of power that we have to uh, to ensure, again, that people with diabetes in, in the Gaza Strip get the supplies that they need to to simply live again. Um, yeah. Without those supplies, there will be no life for those people. And, and, and this is the least that we could do. Again, it's a moral responsibility for us to to speak up, to to feel for others and to to support to support them through what they're going through. Absolutely. Mohammed, thank you so, so much for joining us. I'm so grateful that um, you've taken time from your day to do this, to share with us um, what the situation is and what you know about the situation. Um, you are just such an important voice in our community and I would urge people, we did have um, Mo's, there we go, um, Mo's Instagram there that you can follow um, for updates. 
Um, and as soon as we know where people can make donations to once we're at that stage, I know that that is something that, um, that we'll all be making sure we get that information out as quickly as possible. But in the meantime, uh, can I just also add that it's not about writing a letter or contacting your um, local MPs or your foreign ministers or whatever once do it more than once. You can do it. I, mean, I don't know what it's like everywhere else. Like, if, And I know there are some Aussies watching now, Leon, but there will be other people who watch it back. It's a phone call. Like, you, it, it is a phone call. So there, there are ways that you can do things, but don't just do it once, right? Exactly. The more, the more you, yeah. the more you do it, the more pressure you put. Uh, whether that's on social media, whether that's you yeah. posting something, a story, or posting a post, or uh, speaking about again, speaking about it with your friends, with your family, and and. It, Maybe when you're when you're speaking with your family or friends, it would be only you talking or only you sending that email. To your phone. It would be more people talking about it. it would be uh, a collective again action towards uh, uh, supporting people in in the Gaza Strip for sure. Amazing. Thank you so, so much. I'll continue to reach out to you and, and listen to your very, very important voice in our community around this. Mo, uh, please, thank you. If, you know, in, for the rest of your day and the rest of your World Diabetes Day, I'm sure there is always so much going on. But um, thank you so much. We'll thank keep you. in touch. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Okay, that was, you know, I know that that was um, one of the issues right now globally that people with diabetes are asking for information about how fortunate we are that um, Mohammed there able to 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 uh, lend some insights into to what people in Gaza ex are experiencing right now, but also what we as a collective community and individually can be doing right now. I am now going to uh, introduce Raya Eid. Raya, let's bring you on. I know that you've got a little presentation. Hello. Oh, Hello, there you are. everyone. Hi, Renza. How are you? Right in blue. Happy World Diabetes Day to <laughs> you. Happy World Diabetes Day to you too. You've got a presentation for us, so I'm going to jump off and we'll let you do that, and then we might have a bit of a chat afterwards. Definitely. Thank you so much. Again, so first off, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> So first off, let me thank all of the previous advocates that have talked about their wonderful, inspirational work. Uh, thank you, Mo, for shedding light on the importance of advocacy in times of crisis, no matter where you are in the world. And specifically, Emma, for talking about diabetes situation in low and middle income countries. So for those of you who don't know me, hi, my name is Raya Aid. I am from Lebanon. I've been living with type 1 diabetes for 14 years now. I started off as a local advocate in my diabetes association, the Chronic Care Center. I then joined the IDF YLD program where I was elected as the MENA regional representative. And I'm also, of course, a DDoc voice. And I'm here today to give you my two cents about advocacy, specifically in diabetes in terms of crisis. So the first thing, when your country, your community, wherever you are is going through a crisis, it is very important to start with focusing on yourself. And trust me, this is a mistake I've done many times. You think, okay, I'm an advocate, I'm a volunteer, let me go up there, let me help without grasping the gravity of the situation that had just happened. And believe me, the situation can vary from natural disaster, economic crises, can be physical, non-physical, can be civil unrest. You need to make sure that you're okay, that you understand what happened and you get the, you grasp, sorry, the gravity of the situation, which is when you can expand towards your community. Is there anyone directly next to me or in my area that I can help immediately? Is there something that they need on the spot? And then after that, what you need to look for is your country. And this is where you need to get the facts straight, understand what are the stats, what's the reality of the situation, what do we have? And it's very important here to discuss uh, local organizations, NGOs, governmental organizations, local politicians, whatever you can get your hands on in terms of data, go for it. And here, big organizations, already existing, uh, really do help. For example, in our case, recently we had an unprecedented economic crisis where our local currency lost over 60 folds of its value against the US dollar. Uh, that reduced the average salary to around $50 in Lebanon, 50 US dollars, which is literally equivalent to one packet of insulin, one box of insulin here in Lebanon. 
that caused us to go into a huge crisis. Uh, people were having trouble getting access to healthcare, access to insulin, basic diabetes supplies. We lost a lot of the governmental support on diabetes supplies. And this is when the large organization that I'm a part of, the Chronic Care Center, with the data that we have and the knowledge that we have contacted international organizations, such as Life for a Child and the WHO, which we are very grateful for. They assisted us in, times, in the time of the crisis. They're assisting us currently as the crisis is ongoing. And because of the data that we had and the knowledge that we had and, the, and how large our association was, we were able to get that assistance that we needed as soon as possible. So in terms of country, before going to international advocacy, it's very important to understand what are the resources that we have? How long do we have them? And what do we need? And what's the timeline that we need it for so that you can prioritize your needs before moving on to international advocacy, where maybe one contact of a fellow advocate who knows an advocate, who knows an organization, can get you, can get that ball rolling in terms of getting the assistance that you need. And I know from what I'm talking right now, it kind of sounds overwhelming because you're in a crisis, you don't know what to do, you're just one advocate, you're trying your hardest. And it's very important to know that diabetes advocacy is not just, you know, getting that incident pen to that person, because advocacy in times of crisis can also look like this. Our, our local association, this, the Chronic Care Center, we had a camp for kids this year. We called it the Camp of Warriors. We took a number of kids aged 9 to 12. We had our own camp. We had educational and recreational activities. We got them away from their cities, from the local situation that was ongoing in the country. And we just had a couple of days off where we learned new things, we developed our knowledge and their knowledge, and we kind of took a break while being advocates. It can look like a local YLD meetup where we discuss the latest developments in diabetes research. DDoc can look like advocacy in times of crisis. This is us in Abu Dhabi last year. It was wonderful. It was a break away from everything, but I was still advocating for my country and still discussing the situation that was ongoing. Diabetes advocacy can look as small as one post, the Blue Balloon Challenge, which we've been talking about probably this entire day, it, it truly has its impact. You know, Life for a Child has been doing wonderful work. We're very grateful for it. Personally, I'm very grateful for Life for a Child. And these simple acts can go a long way. The idea of YLD training was also advocacy, and we were in crisis. So Remember, when you feel overwhelmed or you feel like you're burnt out, you can still be an advocate while enjoying your time and not feeling the stress of an ongoing situation and still be helping your community. So I guess my takeaway message here is advocacy in times of crisis is very important. Choose the method that fits best for you. Enjoy the ride. I know it gets hard sometimes, but also take care of yourself. Raya, I have a feeling that you're never not advocating. I am pretty sure that <laughs> if you're awake, <laughs> maybe even in my your eyes sleep, are open, I'm advocating, <laughs> or I'm dreaming absolutely. about advocating. <laughs> Thank you so much for that presentation, and I think Thank that you, you know, I, I really love that breaking it down. I think people. I think sometimes people are afraid of the word advocacy or being called an advocate because they feel that it has to be something really massive and it has to be something that they're seen to be doing. But it can be all of those really small things. They all add up to something bigger, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much. I, a, another absolute shining light in our community. Um, you know, I'll say it again, the kids are all right. The work that you've been, you've been doing with the Young Leaders Program for IDF um, and, you know, as a, and, and with GDOC and, and everyone else, it is just such a privilege to get to hear what you're doing. Um, keep doing it, absolutely. And follow Raya on, um, on socials as well on Instagram where she, will, where she constantly updates us with the work that she's doing. It Thank never you ends. You're, you are <laughs> So it never amazing. does. It never does. Thank you so, so very much. All right. We are now going to move on and welcome Diksha Dev to uh, the screen. Now, Diksha is from India. Hello there. Hey. Hi, Hi Renza. Hello. It's so good to see you. So good to see you too. Happy World Diabetes Day. Happy World Diabetes Day. Have you had a busy one? I actually, it's my diversity today, so it's my 24 diversity. Yeah, so I was diagnosed there <laughs> 24 years back, Amazing. and uh, 
yeah, it's been a celebratory mood. Uh, yes. But I'm looking forward to this more than anything else. Oh, well, that's fantastic. And you're speaking about an incredibly important topic, and that's mental health. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and where what, what is it that you do with work and who you are with diabetes? Because yeah. it's all a little bit intertwined, right? Right. Uh, so I am Deeksha and I've been living with type 1 for the last 24 years. I just completed 23rd year and I entered into my 24 year. I am a counselling psychologist. I never wanted to get into the field of diabetes, but I ended up somehow, it was fated. Um, I worked my niche is working with diabetes, distress and burnout because while interning, I realised that most of the people do not adhere to treatment because they are burnt out. They don't realize yeah. that um, it's a chronic condition and it's relentless and you have to live with it for the rest of your life and it's just going to come and bite you at some point of time. It's going to feel overwhelming. Um, yeah. And that causes a lot of stress, which leads to you not taking care of yourself, in turn having frustration of having diabetes and so on and so forth. So I mostly work with people, sit down with them because lived experience you know works you have a hypo i have a hypo i understand where you're coming from so i just sit down with them we find ways for them to kind of get habituated and not get burnt out how can they just you know not reach that edge of burnout or distress that's yeah. what i work on and even if you have reached there we'll just pull you out i'll yeah. handhold you i'll be at the end of the tunnel with a torch come find me how are conversations around mental health and well-being received? You know, do, do you sometimes sort of have to, you know, really encourage those conversations to happen or are people very, very open to them? Absolutely. I mean, it's still so stigmatised. I feel it's such an intersectional yeah. thing. You know, it's so layered because mental health is already stigmatised and diabetes is stigmatised as well. So when yeah. they both are combined, it's like you are tearing into double the stigma. You have to sit down and sometimes pinpoint that, you know, this might be the reason. Sometimes yeah. just just not keeping the torch on works. You have to like literally handhold them in full that, all right, there's something not right. And it might be because of not just diabetes, but other layers also. It yeah. might be because, you know, the surroundings are more, they are surrounded by people who are more on the lines of diabetes bullies. Uh, yeah. They're constantly telling them, don't do this, don't eat, do, uh, don't eat. Do you have to take insulin all the time? Why are you monitoring so much? Why are you monitoring so less? So it's just too many voices. About yeah, that. absolutely. Now, I know that you brought some photos, so let's perhaps bring them up and you can tell us what we're looking at. Tell us what we've got here. So, so basically, I have been, my entire November is spread out to uh, create awareness around diabetes and the symptoms. So if you can see, I'm holding... Uh, my hand in like the four fingers that I'm holding out. So I was teaching, I teach people the four T's of diabetes, of diagnosing diabetes. And mm -hmm. I make them rot learn it because I feel it's so important. Those four signs are extremely, extremely uh, important. So that's what I do. Uh, we do a sugar testing camp, um, you know, under Diabetes Foundation's fl uh, flagship. So it's just testing everyone who's ever we find so they just come and also we just tell them about general diabetes awareness what is the range that a person who is not living with diabetes should be in and if you are somewhere pre-diabetic or we have diagnosed a few type twos in such camps so this is what i've been doing and i have the next one so this is one of my favorite things so we have a project called diabetes i when i got diagnosed i did not have any uh, peer support at all in 2000s, like I was the only kid who had something called type 1 diabetes. Uh, at diabetes, the best part is that we do these support group parties. And I get to meet these amazing children who are living with diabetes. And they get the support from the very beginning that I and probably most of us did not get. So I'm just sitting down there and, you know, playing with them. Um, same. Uh, I just love this picture of this small child she got diagnosed i think a month back before she came to the first diabetes and uh, everyone around her was at least elder to her uh like teenagers and you know 
uh, young adults, but she was the little one. And she just started playing with Blue Balloon. And it was such a safe space for her. She did not feel that she was not included. So, you know, we want to create those safe spaces for people to come and talk. Her parents were distressed, so we spoke to them. Uh, I always tell everyone that type 1 diabetes does not affect just the person who gets it. It's the entire family that gets impacted. So yeah. that's that. And these are um, my support pillars. So this is my team in Punjab that I actually work with. Uh, and these two, I really want to have a, give a special mention since it's my diabe- uh, diversity. These are my two diabetes in the truest sense. These are my children, my best friends, and uh, that's Ankur and Manshika. And they have been nothing less than a pillar of strength for me throughout not just diabetes, but other things in life as well. The point being is that you need to build your village. You need to find and create that support system if you really want to keep your mental health intact. So I try to do that because you can't do it alone. Amazing. And, you know, I think every time I hear about the work that Diabestes is doing, it, it is overwhelming just listening to it. I can't even imagine what it must be like actually getting it all done because there are so many activities that are just connecting people and supporting people and addressing mental health in little ways that make really, really big difference in terms of people not feeling isolated, in knowing that they have support, in knowing that they're not alone. Your work is so important. The fact that Diabetes has a psychologist working with them is remarkable. Your work is just so important. Is there anything else you would like to share on World Diabetes Day and on your diabetes? Yes. Just one thing that you have to be unabashedly, shamelessly yourself when you are addressing diabetes stigma. Uh, yeah. You you just cannot be ashamed of your diabetes or yourself. So, you know, just be yourself. Uh, say it out proudly and confidently. Don't let anyone pull you down. And yeah. that's what I've done in the last 24 years. <laughs> And so, so well, I will add as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank I hope that you're celebrating your diversity now. Go and yes. have a, have a, I have have a donuts here. So I just got myself a, these donuts. So I'm just going to gorge on them. Be- that, like, well, that sounds perfect. Nice. Yes. That sounds perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Diksha. Thank you so, Thank so, you so much. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Always happy to speak with you. Okay, we are getting down to the very pointy end of our event now, and I'm going to ask Mariana Gomez to turn on her camera and her microphone and make sure that she's ready to join us on screen. Mariana, it is always such a pleasure to speak with you. How are you today? Happy World Diabetes Day. Renza, happy World Diabetes Day. It's always a pleasure to be here with the DDOP team, with you, of course, and all my diabetes day. I hope that your day has been uh, as happy as mine has been so far. It's been happy. It's been long. It is literally, uh, it's been going now for about 20 hours. So (laughs) Diabetes Day is a big day. It's a very big day. Um, All right. So tell us what what are you, we're speaking about insulin access, which, Mm -hmm. you know what, we should be talking about this every day. But again, what better day to, to showcase and highlight that today as, you know, as World Diabetes Day. So let's start. I'm going to get you to, to, to start us off and then we'll, we'll have a bit of a chat about it. Thank you, of course. First, uh, if you don't mind, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, yes, for, those of, yes. for those of you who don't know me and who I have had not had the pleasure to meet, my name is Mariana and I'm Jorge's mother. Uh, and I joke around with the fact that I'm now Jorge's mother because there have been two times in my life where I felt like I've lost part of my identity. Uh, one of these times was back in 2006 when I became Jorge's mother and now I'm being referred to as Jorge's mom. I'm not Mariana anymore. I'm just someone's mom. Uh, I've enjoyed every minute of it. I cannot, I cannot complain. But the other uh, time in my life where I felt I, I lost part of my identity was back in 1984 when I was simply named the girl who got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in Mexico. And that was me. And that was me for a very long time. Uh, I was diagnosed in Mexico many years ago, as some of you know. Uh, in my country in the 80s, we had no access whatsoever 
to the internet and no access whatsoever to easy and reliable information on diabetes. There was no diabetes education in a formal way. There was no access to insulin analogs. There were no glucose meters. There were no healthcare providers who had the knowledge enough to identify the warning signs of type 1 diabetes. And yet there I was. Uh, my diagnosis was complicated enough. Uh, I fell into a coma and I was partially dead for a couple of minutes. Uh, my parents received the news that I probably wouldn't be alive, but it was mere luck or coincidence that someone was uh, fast enough to recognize one of the warning signs, a fruity odor smell in my breath. Uh, my story, and I always try to share it as, as much as I can, is not unique in my country. It is very common. The uniqueness of my story is that I'm still here, and that's not the case for everyone in my country. And that brings me an additional layer of responsibilities when talking about access and when talking about advocacy and when working with different organizations and when volunteering. That's the reason why World Diabetes Day is perhaps one of the most tiring days for me, because, of course, I feel like I have to use the privilege that life has brought me, uh, the privilege of being born again, to give something back to my community. Now, speaking about uh, advocacy particularly, I believe that my work has been around storytelling. You'll always hear me say things like, and where's that in Spanish? Because I feel like storytelling has always been something very natural for me. And I believe that stories and the narrative of people can shape the way that we live with certain life conditions, including type one diabetes. For me, being able to read and understand English was also a privilege because that opened many doors for me as I was able to read and understand what was going on in Australia, for example, what was happening in the United States. And I was very fast to translate that information for my peers. So advocacy at first for me was, as you mentioned earlier today, a very scary term. Uh, I, would, I would immediately reply that I was not an advocate because, of course, I'm not involved in politics whatsoever. And I was like, no, I'm not an advocate. But then I realized that just sharing stories and translating information for my peers was probably one of the things that I wish that I had received back when I was very young. Now, insulin access in Mexico is a topic that we've been discussing for many years now. Uh, in 2020, I believe it was, I wrote a piece with a couple of colleagues of mine, 41 International, where we were discussing the cost of insulin. Back then, in 2020, the cost of insulin was something around 700 and 800 Mexican pesos, which is something like 40 US dollars. If you compare the pricing in Mexico of insulin to the pricing in the United States, you would immediately believe that it is very cheap. And it is confusing because, because people would assume that it is very easy to live with type 1 diabetes in Mexico, because of course, that is very cheap. However, uh, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's something that needs to be considered. In Mexico, only three out of 10 Mexicans will have money enough to pay that price it is still unavailable for pretty much everyone. Our state works in a way that even when there are guidelines for the management of type 1 diabetes that of course include different types of insulins and glucose monitors, we will not receive them. Uh, there are social determinants of health that will even have an additional impact on the way that we access to our tools. Uh, last time that I checked, and this information is back from 2020, last time that I checked, insulin price had had rised uh, a lot, and it was during uh, one of uh, one very big natural disaster that we recently had. We had a, a hurricane hitting one of the coasts in Mexico, and we decided to provide support to our peers. In these cases, as some of my peer advocates know, we cannot just wait and see what our governments will do. We have to act very fast. And it was the power of social media and the power of advocacy and the power of the community that helped us all gather all the resources necessary to help our peers in Guerrero in this case. So when it comes to insulin access, it is hard for me to say that we have not done enough. Uh, we have to do more research because we need statistics on type 1 diabetes in Mexico. We do not know how many people exactly there are with type 1 diabetes in a country like mine. Thankfully, mm -hmm. we now have tools like the T1D index that will serve as amazing advocacy tools once we learn how to use them adequately. And we need to start doing more research. We need to find where our people are, how are they living and the, the challenges that they're facing. Uh, now that I live in the United States, of course, I, I wish I had more time. 
uh, I wish I was less burnt because of diabetes and because life as it is, uh, so that I could get more involved in understanding how the landscape analysis is and how the health system works. Because what I can see now here is that insulin pricing is just terribly absurd. I cannot understand uh, this very complicated health system, but I can also see that my peers, people who look like me, who speak the language that I do, who speak Spanish in the United States, even when we're the largest minority, we are the ones who have probably less access to the tools uh, for diabetes management that we need. So now I cannot just be a witness, you know, I have to do better. So I guess that, that my point is, uh, if we are advocating, I believe that we can learn from each other from the diabetes space and we can acquire these tools, learning from other organizations, DW1 International, even Beyond Type 1, Mexican Diabetes Federation, Life for a Child. We can all build bridges together and we can help train and advocate uh, and form more advocates because we, we really need them. Yeah, absolutely. And your advocacy, Mariana, is just so important. And I'm always so grateful that um, that I get to hear about it, that we get to hear about it as part of the DDOT platform as well. Thank you so, so much. I know that, um, again, you know, I, I, I found that really interesting what you were saying at the beginning that, you know, you feel your identity is taken because you're someone's mom and, you know, whatever. And, hey, that's a really cool thing to be. But, my goodness, Mariana, you are very, very, very important and, and everybody knows you in our community. So thank you so, so much for you, today. Enjoy the rest of World Diabetes Day. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, just so, so grateful that you've been here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, we now have, we've already touched on diabetes stigma. We're going to talk about diabetes stigma a little bit more, but now we're going to be speaking with Kasumi Okada from Japan and talking specifically about the situation when it comes to diabetes stigma in Japan. Um, so we will have Kasumi join us now and, um, and I've got just a few questions here. Kasumi, it's so nice to meet you. How are you? Yeah, nice to meet you. I'm glad to have this opportunity to talk to you uh happy world diabetes day but actually it is now november 15 in japan uh, but my heart is still world diabetes day it's it's the same in australia it's the 15th <laughs> too um let me ask you what are some of the stigmas related to diabetes in japan please okay in japan 55 percent of diabetes uh, diabetes is type 2 it is also known as a lifestyle related disease. There is a false perception that diabetes is caused by poor lifestyle habits. I have type 1 diabetes and I have been mistakenly thought to have a bad lifestyle as well. Uh, I have had colleagues warn me about eating ramen. I, even though I love ramen and I feel that there is still a lot of misinformation about diabetes spreading around. Yeah, absolutely. So are advocacy initiative activities widespread in Japan? Are they happening across the country? Yeah, uh, the Japan Diabetes Society and the Japan Diabetes Association are working to eliminate stigma and they are working on it for us. Recently, it was announced that the, the Japanese given name for diabetes will tend to a more English-like uh, designation. There are pros and cons, but I personally think it, it would be a good start to get everyone interested in and discussing diabetes. Yeah, absolutely. So, Kazumi, what, what do you do with your advocacy work? Can you tell us about that? Thank you. Uh, please go to the next slide. Uh, it's great to know about the DDoc in initiative. I thought it was a great idea. I was so impressed. Uh, there is no opportunity for PWDs to enter academic congress in Japan, actually. Recently, we have been holding panel discussion for PWDs in the form of public lectures as part of the congress program. But it is the same formation as DDoc, but it is something for PWDs hosted by medical professionals. As yet, uh, PWDs organized symposium for both medical professionals and PWDs has never been held in field of uh, di diabetes in Japan. I'm now working with my friends and supporters to plan the first attempt at next year's Diabetes Congress. 
Uh, yeah. So Amazing. That, wow. That that's that is fantastic. Um, what are your concerns and and what are the difficulties that you see? Thank you. Uh, I'm interested in how the medical community feels when they hear the story of PWDs. I also feel a little scared. Yeah, I I know that the medical professionals are doing their best for PWDs so hard, but sometimes that is not communicate well to the PWDs, PWDs. That is why I don't want to make it a one side place where PWDs request or communicate it one way or another. So I find it difficult to create a place where they don't feel that way. I hope that it will be an opportunity for medical professionals and PWDs to share the same goals and talk from the same pers perspective in the exam room. Uh, of course, I hope it will be a running experience for PWDs as well. I find uh, DDoc's activities is uh, really helpful and educational. Uh, we will step to make this benefit opportunity like DDoc Symposium. Fantastic. I think, Kasumi, thank you so, so much for sharing the situation in Japan, what you're planning to do, which sounds very exciting. Um, and we're looking forward to hearing it. I hope that you'll come back and tell us about how it's all gone oh. at another time. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Everybody, wow, what an incredible program we have had uh, today, tonight, this morning, um, whatever time it is for people. Um, I think that we have really, you know, once again, we, we you know, one of the incredible uh, things about Doc Days and about DDoc is having um, real reach into the community from across the globe and hearing some remarkable stories about what people are doing. It is a day of celebration, World Diabetes Day, but it's also a day of reflection and a day of understanding what it is that we can be doing with our advocacy efforts just to support each other um, and hopefully I think that everybody is going to go away tonight with um, with a list of things that they are going to be able to do to, to help themselves and help other people with diabetes. We've heard stigma mentioned, we just heard Kasumi mention it, Diksha mentioned it, it's come up at other times and I'm so, so delighted to say that one of the things that I did today was to host the event that um, officially launched the international consensus statement um, to end diabetes stigma uh, and the pledge as well. I know that DDoc has certainly taken the pledge. I know that so many people on the call have taken the pledge. Um, you, if you haven't yet, it literally takes you one minute, go to enddiabetesstigma.org and please do sign it. Um, take it to your organization. And you know what you don't, it doesn't have to only be diabetes organizations that are signing this pledge. We want this to get there out there as widely, as widely as possible. Stigma is harmful. We want to do everything we can to end it. We now have this consensus statement. 51 people were on the expert international expert committee and a third of those people were people with diabetes. Um, there were also researchers, health professionals and people from diabetes organisations as well. Um, it is something that we that, that belongs to the community so please use it in a way that um, absolutely is going to help with those efforts to stop diabetes related stigma. Now we're going to wrap up now but before I do that we've got some dates that we want you to add to your calendar and things that we want you to do. Firstly you have got until the 3rd of December to apply for a DDoc Voices Scholarship for ATTD next year. In um, It's in March, the 6th to the 9th of March, and that will be in Florence. Applications are also open for, oh, sorry, not now. Not now. They are not open now. Next year, on the 1st of February, they will be open for um, the DDG conference in Berlin. Um, the DUK professional conference, so that's the Diabetes UK conference in London, and also for ADA in Orlando. So, you know, we don't stop. There are lots and lots of things. Keep these dates in your diary um, so that you apply and you make sure that you get in before the cutoff date. And I would like to remind everybody that DDG is a German language conference, so it is only open to um, DDoc voices from the region. And of course, we have virtual events coming up all 
always, we've got Doc J in support of Spera Rose and that will be on Tuesday, the 14th of February, Valentine's Day. Come and bring your red hearts and and um, and, and donate to Life to Insulin for Life, um, who are our charity partner there. Thank you so much to everybody who has joined us. Thank you so, so very much to our speakers who have been incredibly remarkable and, and generous in giving their time today to everybody watching from around the world, to the amazing, amazing DDoC team behind the scenes, in particular, um, Morgan and Teba, who have been um, making this all happen. Um, Morgan has been sending me messages to make sure that I think maybe I think she's been trying to make sure that I'm awake, but just to make sure that this all runs on track and Tebo has been making sure that everybody has got their camera on, is ready to go. Thank you, team. What an amazing team you are. I'm the one who gets to be on camera, but they're making great things happen. And the rest of the DDoC team who are also making sure that our platform for everybody is here so that we can elevate the, the voices and the activities and the efforts of people with diabetes in the diabetes community. Um, if, you are if it's still World Diabetes Day in your part of the world, please go celebrate. But every single, every single day is a day for us to talk about diabetes and raise awareness um, and to support each other. Community is everything. And my goodness, what an incredible community the DDoC community is. Thank you so much, everybody, and good night. Good morning. Good day to you all. <laughs>